to be in your word, to understand what it is that, the, that you're saying in this day to all of us. Father, we love you and we thank you for our time together. For it is in Jesus' name that we ask it. Amen. You know, um, I've been praying uh, con concerning the, the times that we're in right now. And one of the things that, as you know, we do our Saturday morning um, insights program. For those of you that have been tuning in to our, our um, insights program on Saturdays. And I've had different individuals that have come on. Uh, this coming Saturday, we have, um, who? oh, Pastor Jeff. Um, Pruitt from Milwaukee. He's going to be with us. Uh, last week we had Tony uh, Higginson from Manchester, England. And we're just hearing what men of God are saying around, uh, around the world. What are they saying for our times? And what do we see happening right now? And I'm super excited about uh, it, this. This is an orchestrated move of God, I believe. And it's just a, it's a great time to see how God is working and moving uh, in everybody's lives. So for that, I'm very excited. Uh, with that in mind, though, tonight, I'm going to start talking about revival, because I believe that we're in a window of revival. And uh, just so that we can cut down on the noise and things like that, I've got everybody muted right now. But I will unmute all oh, that way you can mute yourself unless you have a comment. And feel free, for those of you that might be new, we have an open dialogue. We like to just uh, talk about what God is doing. And so it's not just a time where we come together where I'm going to ramble for 45 minutes, but it's a time where we'd love to come together and just, you know, hear what God is saying to all of you as well. So with that, feel free to um, uh, jump in at any time or raise your hand. I think there's a little... Uh, reaction button down there on the right where you can uh, do do something. I, th I think there was a place where you can raise your hand or something like that, but uh, if not, I'm going to go ahead and unmute everybody. If you could mute yourself, I'm going to leave it to you. Um, and that way we'll cut down on as much noise as possible. But I want to start tonight in Second Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. And this has been a passage of scripture that has just been resonating in me. I cannot uh, get away from it. So 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. I'm reading right now out of the King James Version. And um, it says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Uh, passage of scripture um, has been a very familiar passage of scripture to many of us. And as a result, I get excited every time I read it. But I believe that here in the United States, when we look at revival, and starting tomorrow, I'm going to be doing a series on revivals in our daily Bible study. So those of you that may not be familiar with that. You can go to YouTube. We just started this a couple weeks ago. You can subscribe and you'll get a notice every time. Now I put the Bible studies up at 3 a.m. Pacific time so our East Coast friends can get them at 6. So if they're early risers, uh, the Bible studies will be up at 6 uh, a.m. on the East Coast. But we're going to start uh, looking at revivals. And I was only going to go back about I was only going to go back into the 19th century, but I think I'm going to go all the way back into the 18th century and take a look at the four, what's known as the four great awakenings, uh, because they all lead to one another. And there's a window of time that it seems that God gives us worldwide in times of revival. Now, we've never had an opportunity, never had an opportunity like we do today. Um, to give you an example of some of the uh, revivals that we have seen in the past, some of the things that we would call um, the Great Awakenings. The first Great Awakening was really in um, 1730. It went from 1730 to about 1755. Uh, the second Great Awakening was at the latter part of the 18th century from 1790 to 1840. 
The third Great Awakening was 1855 to 1930. And then the fourth, or what they call the Fourth Great Awakening, was from 1960 to 1980. Now, some of us remember that time frame. We remember what it was like in the 60s all the way through the 80s where we had the Jesus movement, uh, Jesus people. There were a lot of people being born again, giving their lives to Jesus, and it wasn't anything like uh, what we see today. I mean, it was absolutely um, anti um uh, government you know we were we through that period we went through the vietnam war and people were protesting so much but people were seeking once again something that would make a difference in their lives and many were finding jesus we're at the beginning of our century we really saw the pentecostal movement uh explode and pentecost really came back into um being uh, the move of the future, uh, and and it was really a powerful move, starting uh, really in Topeka, Kansas, and then moving to Azusa Street uh, in 1906. There was quite a, a revival uh, that went through during that time. But then the Jesus movement hit, and you see people that were uh, the church in a lot of ways rejected traditional church because they didn't fit the mold. Uh, they came in uh, playing different music. They had longer hair. They had the long hairstyles. They were smoking dope, doing all kinds of things. I know one of my um, uh, good friends, uh, Ruckins McKinley, Prophet Ruckins McKinley, got born again smoking a joint listening to Amy Grant. And so he was down in Hollywood doing his thing. And God just touched him and met him right where he was. And that's one of those things that I think is just absolutely wonderful when you see how God operates like that and takes it out of the norm. Now, that is not an endorsement of smoking dope. Um, all it is is saying that God can reach you wherever you're at. And, and I love that aspect that God is no respecter of persons. If he's done it for one, he'll do it for all. But through that, we came into a real understanding of a new move of God. But I want you to think, since then, it's been 40 years since the last real move of God worldwide. And what I want us to see is what's going to happen in the U.S. right now. I believe that we've been granted a window of opportunity. Now, what the devil's meant for destruction with this COVID-19, God will turn for his glory. And it's going to be a phenomenal time for the church. It's not going to be a time where we're going to look back and say, oh, I wish that had never happened. We're going to look back and think of the hundreds and thousands of people whose testimony from now on will always have COVID-19 in it. Okay. Some are coming to Jesus for the very first time. Some are returning to Jesus. Some have had their faith turned upside down, and they're starting to realize that it's not um, – business as usual. It's not their relationship as usual. Things have changed. And I'm so excited because we've all seen what that has done in our lives. So uh, I know in India right now, it's in a real lockdown state. Um, I know up north even further, they were only allowed out of their homes for like two to three hours. And then they were allowed to uh, get necessities, but then they had to go right back. Is that is that what you're seeing there right now, uh, Simron? Is the same thing going on there? Same thing. Let me. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's something else to see when they've only got a couple hours a day to get out and do what they want, and you've got a a country of 1.3 billion people that are struggling. And how do we? Uh, even equate, I mean, even in our stay-at-home orders that we have here in the U.S., it's nothing compared to what they're going through there. And so many people are without food. I mean, the basic necessities, they just don't have it. In some of these rural areas, I don't even know how they're making it. Um, I'm getting words from some of our uh, pastors uh, from northern India all the way to southern India saying that they are struggling in just about every way. And we want them to understand that God's provision is for them to stand strong and, and trust God through this time. But for those of us that have become complacent, because really when you don't have a need, what do you do? 
you don't have a dependence on God either. My prayer for you is, and I was talking with um, Pastor Stephen Strader from Lakeland, Florida, and uh, Stephen was on our Insights program a couple weeks ago, and he said, you know, his biggest concern through this whole thing was that it does not revert to business as usual, like after 9-11. I mean, after 9-11, there was about a 90-day span there where people were really seeking God. But then after about 90 days, it just went back to business as usual. And our prayer is that that is not what is happening here, that we will never forget this time frame because it has caused us to do things we would never do, to look at things we've never done, to reach out like we've never reached out before. And with all of that, I'm super excited to see what God's going to do. But let's take a moment before we dive into Scripture. I want to hear from some of you uh, what God has been doing in your life, what's become real to you in this week. Um, and so let's just go ahead and, and hear from some of you now. Well, I'll, I'll say something <laughs> as usual. Um, you know, Last week I was pretty excited because Kevin was supposed to get to come home and um, his flight was canceled. So he didn't get to come home. And um, he called me and he said, well, you know, my flight's been canceled and you know, there's a workaround that would leave me in the Denver airport for seven hours with a possibility. And, and I said, no, nah, that doesn't feel right. And he said, no, I think at this point we're supposed to stop and just, I'm going to wait for about three weeks and try to come home for a week because I don't think we're supposed to be doing this right now. And so after we got off the phone, and I know I texted you, Pastor Lonnie, I, I started thinking about how like children we can be when it comes to things of God, because I had to make a choice right then if this was punishment or protection. Yeah. And I, both Kevin and I, firmly believe we really feel like this is protection like god is saying not yet and stay where you are because it's not safe for you to travel right now um and we're good with that but it, we yeah. had to we both had to like pause for a minute and step back and make it an actual choice an active choice of how we were going to interpret what was happening and we we came out of it actually really grateful because we're we're under god's protection amen amen it's it's um wonderful to know that we've got that choice on our outlook our perspective how are we going to see this moment because once you start seeing things in a negative mode you can spiral really fast and you just start going out of control and a lot of people become super depressed they don't know where to go from there it's a difficult thing for them and so we really uh, you know, making those choices. I'm going to see this for what it is. God, your hand is in this. And uh, your word says that the steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord. So thank you for directing me in this moment so that it's your hand of protection in my life. You'll lead me where I need to be. You know, it takes us back to what Luther said during the, the bubonic plague. You know, as far as medicines and potions, I will take them. I will fumigate. I will, you know, isolate i'll do whatever i need to do but if god calls me to do something or needs me to go see somebody then i will do it and uh, i thought that was just great wisdom um at that point in time to uh dr johan hess the pastor he was writing to just a powerful powerful message he had somebody else well i think for for me um and even Chris, it's been patience, learning patience. Um, he finally got called off quarantine Wednesday night to do some night shifts the last few days. Um, so sitting there patiently waiting. <laughs> patience, too, is just the lack of communication because where he's at, there's not a great signal. Okay. So being able to talk to him all the time just has not been an option. <laughs> so. Just wait and be patient. There, there's been a lot of patience going on. So, Amen. So we're learning patience. We're learning God's direction. What else is going on? 
I've been going through um, a book on the names of Jesus. And one of the things that I just appreciate so much is the fact that when God told Moses to say, I am that I am. Yes. It means everything to me because he is what we need at any given time in in our day, in our week, in our relationships. Um, the name is the Emmanuel, I am with you. Another book I was reading was talking about how Gideon heard God's name or how Gideon understood that God was not only with him, he was for him. And that has meant a lot for to me too it's one thing to know that god's with me but it's another thing to know that through whatever it is that he's also for me amen very good very good somebody else one of the things that justin and i have had to realize is we've honestly had to stop ourselves and remind ourselves that we are going through a pandemic because literally god We've had God's favor, and I know there are several people in this group that can say the same thing. We are both still working. We are both prospering. My cupboards are full. I don't have any needs, none. I'm, I, I'm, I shouldn't, I'm not shocked. I, you know, I know that God will take care of us, and I know that he, you know, he honors his word, Um but we're so fortunate and I keep, I've had a few small opportunities. I keep asking God, you know, like, I know there's people that have needs lead me to the right people, you know, because we're blessed. So we need to bless others. And I've had a couple of opportunities. Um, one woman, um, she really felt like she wasn't supposed to go stock up on toilet paper. So she didn't, she was just trusting God. And um, she works at a, a restaurant where we pick up food and, I asked her if she needed some and she said, I was almost out. I mean, just so that might seem really small to us, but to the person who was running out of toilet paper, that was probably a very big deal. Yeah. Um, but the biggest thing, honestly, that Justin and I are just in awe of the fact that God's just taking care of us. Amen. Amen. God's provision. He still is Jehovah Jireh. You know, he's still the one that's providing. All right. Anybody else have a comment you'd like to share? You know, for so long, for about 15 years or so, I traveled so much. And I spent a lot of time by myself. I mean, you're with the guys at work, but then you come home to an empty house. And uh, it's one thing to do that for a week, a few weeks, a month. It's another thing to do that for six months. And then you're constantly moving job to job to job every six months. And you just get tired. And you, yeah, you can do video calls and you can talk on the phone, but it's just not the same as coming home and smelling your wife's perfume when you walk in the door. You know? I'm so glad you're home, Lee. <laughs> I'll tell you, um, <laughs> I traveled for years. And today, you know, um, we had a job that wasn't so pleasant to do regarding plumbing. We won't go into a lot of detail, <clears throat> but it was so fun to uh, just work on a job like that together. Some of you can find joy in just being with her and doing the grossest of jobs, and you're yeah. laughing and you're having a good time at it. Amen. Uh -oh. Well, as we start taking a look at revival, I believe that we have a window of opportunity here, and that's what I'm, I'm calling it, a window of opportunity for God's power to be shown real in the United States. We have for years been on a declination of morals, declination of understanding of the word of God, um, people calling good evil, they're calling evil good. And, and it's time for this to stop. It's time for this, um, for the church to rise up and speak prophetically, if you will, into the heavens to make demands on the, the power of God. James said, you have not because you ask not. That word ask, iteo in the Greek is the word demand. You're, you don't have anything because you're not demanding of me. And it's time for us to speak into heavenlies in, in, and say, this is the word of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. This is what will take place. Now, a lot of people will be a little freaked out by 
the prophetic when it rises strong because it's unfamiliar. It's an unfamiliar voice to many of them. Those of you that are familiar with the prophetic, it'll your spirit just leaps when you hear it. It's like, yes, this is the word of the Lord. This is what we need to be hearing right now. And it's time for the apostles and prophets to rise up and say, this is what God is doing. Let me tell you how we're going to navigate this. And that's exactly what's going to be taking place. It cannot be after the fact or after the fact we go, wow, we really blew it. We missed that one. No, we need to be saying now, here's the, the window, the time frame that we have that's open. And if we will jump through this window right now, spiritually, prophetically, I believe we can reverse the course that we have seen taking place. Now, hear me. I do believe that the, the return of Jesus is much closer than it's ever been in my entire life. Now, nobody knows the day or the hour, but I will say this, that we will never, ever eradicate everything because as the day approaches, the more we're going to see. We're going to have wars, rumors of wars, earthquake, earthquakes, famines, pestilence. All of that stuff is going to be taking place around the world. But we are the believers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And his promises are yea and amen to those of us who believe. It doesn't matter what's going on around us. His promises are sure and true. And we do not have to give in to the pressure and the circumstances that are around us. So I'm believing that through this time, the body of Christ is getting stronger and stronger and stronger that will make a move that is unprecedented in any of previous revivals. I think what you're going to see is all these others that have taken place throughout the years are going to be like rolled into one major last thrust of the Spirit drawing all men unto himself. And think about it like this. Where else could we have something like this take place if it wasn't for the technology that we have? I mean, right now, we've got people in different, you know, at least five different time zones that I'm aware of from around the world that are able to get on a single meeting and say, listen, here's what God is doing right now in and through me. And here's what God is going to be doing. And the voice is the same. The more that we're hearing worldwide, the voice is the same. I've had people ask me when I've gone out and I've um, done things like this. They said, who have you been listening to? Who have you been uh, talking with? And honestly, um, this might be a bit of an admission, but I don't listen to a whole lot uh, of what takes place. I want to hear what God is saying. And I'm, I'm not trying to be influenced by every other voice. Does that make sense? But when I talk with my friends around the world and we start comparing notes, what God is saying, it blows me away. It's like God is speaking to you the same exact things that he's speaking to us. There is no difference. And we know Proverbs 11, 11 says, through the blessing of the righteous, a city will be elevated. It's now time for us to bless and not curse, to speak the word of the Lord over these situations, to declare what God is doing and then absolutely make sure that in our hearts, we're ready, we're prepared for whatever it is. Um, one of the revivals I'll be talking about is the revival uh, that took place by the Hebrides in the United Kingdom. And the Hebrides revival was a very powerful revival in the islands uh, off of Scotland. And it started, it was part of this, the third awakening. And... Um, Pentecost broke out there before it broke out in the United States. It was 1904, 1905, this Hebrides revival really took off. And it was in this revival that these two little ladies, one was basically deaf, one was bent over, one was blind. And um, what was interesting about it is they were praying. They couldn't go to church, so they'd pray in their homes that God would have a move in their land, in their region. And the funniest thing they did, I mean, to me, it seemed funny, but it, it made sense to them. What they did is they went and they confronted their pastor and they said, are you right with God? Now, that seems like a question that you wouldn't necessarily want to say, is that where you're at? But that's what these ladies did. They went and confronted him and said, are you right with God? Because we're praying for revival. 
and they understood that if revival comes and you're not ready, this is going to be a tough situation. And so they wanted to know, and everything was good. Revival broke out in that area. I mean, people getting baptized with the Holy Ghost, born again, uh, the power of God sweeping through their land. And we have a very special tie to that revival. And most people don't realize the tie that we have to that revival, but there is a special tie that our nation has to that revival. And uh, so when I get there, I, I don't want to reveal it too soon, but when we get there, I'm going to be talking about uh, the tie that we have to that revival, how it affects us today. But in Second Chronicles 7.14, this is where we're going to start, and this is where we're going to be talking all week in our Bible study. But as we started, it says, if my people, which are called by my name. Now let's just stop there for a moment. If my people, God's referring to the nation of Israel at the time. Today, we know that the church uh, and Israel parallel each other, but the church really, Israel is a type and shadow of what the church would be doing today. And God says, if my people which are called by my name. Now, in the New Testament, the church is referred to as the ecclesia, which comes from two Greek words, one ek, the other kaleo, and it means to be called out from. So when we take a look at who we are today, God says, I'm talking to my people. I'm not talking to just anybody. I'm talking to my people. And if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves. I think too often we're waiting for politicians, we're waiting for rulers, for kings, whoever it might be. We want them to make sure that what they're doing is important. But the reality is that it's up to us. It's not up to those leaders to do it. It's up to us, the called out ones, the church. We're to humble ourselves. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean to humble ourselves? When it comes time for us to humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God, I define true humility as this. True hum humility is the ability to receive what God has said about you and act upon it. That's true humility. It's the ability to, to hear what God has said about you and act upon it. Now, the reason I put it like that is many people feel that being humble or having a humble spirit means to be weak, uh, uh, you know, always backing away, always cowering. But that's not what humility is. Humility is the ability to put our thoughts behind, bringing every thought captive, making them obedient to Christ, and recognizing that what God has said about you is true. If God says you're the head, not the tail, you're always above and not beneath, guess what? That's who you are. There's nothing wrong with saying that about your life. That's who you are. To be humble is to receive that. To be humble is not to go around demeaning yourself in the name of humility. Oh, I'm nothing. I'm, I'm nothing. Wait a minute. In John 17, Jesus said, the glory that you've given me, I've given them. Now, what is, what is he saying? He's, it, it's not trying to say, I don't, I'm, I'm nobody, I'm, I'm just a nothing, I'm just a worthless worm. I'm, we don't need to act like that. That's not humility. That's not what God said about you. You are a child of the King. You're a child of the Most High. You can act like royalty. That's okay. The difference is, is you must not allow humility, which is the ability to receive what God has said about you and act upon it, to become arrogance or to become pride or to become demeaning to other people. Anytime we would cause somebody else to stumble, cause them to fall because of our liberty, then I think we've crossed over from humility into pride and arrogance. And at that point in time, we cause people to stumble. Now, some of you will remember when we first started taking a look at the time we were in, oh, what, two months ago, and we talked about uh, Luther. He said one of the things that he refused to do was cause somebody else to stumble in their faith. And he wasn't going to do it. 
if you had great faith and you knew that COVID-19 was never going to affect you because Psalm 91 is true, no plague is going to come near your dwelling. It's not going to touch you. Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law. He, he paid the price for our healing. Isaiah 53, 5 says, with his stripes you are healed. Matthew 8, 16 and 17 says that Jesus healed all that were sick and afflicted, that it might be fulfilled by the prophet Isaiah. 1 Peter 2, 24 says, and with his stripes you are healed. Psalm 107, 20 says he sent his word and healed them. Isaiah 55 says his word will never return void. I mean, if you can go through the scripture like that and just say, I know what God's word has said, that's awesome. But that doesn't mean go out and, and try and prove that you can stand against this plague or this disease or whatever you want to call it. That's foolishness. That's getting into tempting God. To be wise is to say, I'll go wherever God wants me to go. I had a gentleman um, text me this morning, and he said, I've been praying about India. I think you need to go back. And I said, well, I'm always open to, to the leading of the Lord. If he wants me there, I'll go there. And, uh, but I'm not making any commitments. I've not heard God say that to me yet. But if he wants me there, I'll hop a plane tomorrow. If that's what it takes, I'll go visit. We've got 67 pastors in the nation of India right now in our ministry. I would love to be with them. I would love to be there and help them. I'd love to be there and build them. But we can do so much in what we're doing this way as well. And just say, we're going to love them. We're going to strengthen them every way that we can. And when it's possible, if God wants me there, I'll be there. And you know what? It doesn't matter. God's hand of protection will be there. So I'm excited about those types of things. Um, but let's not allow our humility to cross over into arrogance or presumption. He goes on and he says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray. Do you know that every great revival that has ever started has started with praying people? People were praying. But this word in the Hebrew means something actually a little different. It's not just praying as we understand it, but it's a worshipful prayer. It's not just praying as in many people today pray. When they pray, they only have a request of God. Now, this, this type of prayer was, I'm acknowledging who you are. I'm worshiping you because you're God. See, if we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, then he moves. But it's not just humbling ourselves and then making a request of God. Too often we think that if we humble ourselves and then say, God, fix our nation, do this. No, that's not what he's saying. Get into this atmosphere of worship. Get into this atmosphere of acknowledging who I am. Because guess what? It's really not about us, other than the fact that God loves us, wants us delivered. But he wants that for the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But the way he touches the world is still through us, his church, his bride. And we've been so caught up in beautifying ourselves. It's like the bride in front of the mirror. We want to make sure the makeup's perfect, the lipstick's on, everything's great. We're getting ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're getting ready for this great feast. But we have forgotten what our role is. And we beautified ourselves. Now, let me put it in more plain terms. The church has spent so much time making sure it looks good, its services are perfect, everything. And I'm all for excellence. You know that. I'm not against any of that. But not to the exclusion of reaching people. It used to drive me crazy when, when I would get together with a group of pastors and they would say, you know, we're just part of that remnant. We're part of that remnant that is mature. Well, if you're that mature, how many people have you reached with the gospel? Well, that's not our call. We're the remnant that's mature. No, you're not. Your only purpose on planet Earth is to reach the lost. And as long as you're reaching the lost, you're going to have a lot of immaturity around you. Why? Because they're newborn babes in Christ. So I, get, I just get a little fired up when I hear people say, well, the reason there's only 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 of us here is because we're just that remnant. No, allow the Spirit of God to do something. Anything that's alive is going to grow. 
yeah, I understand their seasons. Ecclesiastes says there's seasons for everything. And there's times where things are hid from sight. And that's okay. And, and never despise the day of small beginnings. So I'm not talking about small things. What I'm talking about are the excuses we make for not doing what God has said to do. If he's told us to go into all the world and preach this gospel, then that's what we get to do. Um, and if it's a matter of doing it just through lifestyle, then great, do it through lifestyle. But all of us are called to be evangelizing, if you will, spreading the good word, spreading the gospel of Jesus, which is good news. In a COVID-19 time, what is good news? You don't have to lose to this thing. Your, your, your job doesn't have to suffer. Your income doesn't have to go down. You don't have to catch this disease. You don't have to lose loved ones to this. See, but unfortunately what has happened, we've, we've fallen into the stream of where everybody's going, that this is just such a devastating thing. We're going down that stream. I understand the devastation that it causes, but it's not bigger than my Jesus. He's bigger than this devastation. I don't have to get caught up in that stream, but it's easier to get caught up in that stream than to stand by faith. Because remember, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That word is the rhema word, the revelation that comes alive on the inside of us. I'm going to stand by faith in knowing who he is and what he's done in my life. I refuse to allow this situation to dictate to me how I'm going to live tomorrow. I'm just not going to do it. Uh, this is going to be what God has for me in this day. And you know what? He wasn't caught off guard by COVID-19. He wasn't caught off guard by any employment status. He wasn't caught off guard by any of this. So if God wasn't caught off guard, and we are, that means we need to line up to what he has. Because he wasn't caught off guard. So God, what do you want from me? I'm going to worship you. I'm going to I'm going to pray in that worshipful way and seek his face. Remember, seek my face. Now, this next one, turn from their wicked ways. Who's he talking to? His people. They were caught up in idolatry. They were caught up in many things that were not of God. And they were generation to generation to generation. So God says, if my people will humble themselves, seek my face, pray, turn from their wicked ways. What does that mean we have to do? Turn away from those things that are contrary to God. Now, contrary to God doesn't just mean the blatant sin that we see. Remember what Hebrews said when we studied faith. Hebrews says it's the weight and sin that easily besets us. And too often we trade God's will for what's good. Now, God's will is good, but that does not mean that everything that's good is necessarily God's will. Nor does it mean that it's good, so it's sinful. Does that make sense? I want us to understand this, because too often we can go do something that's perfectly fine. It's not full of sin, except it causes us to do something that wasn't the best that God would have had us do. I'll give you an illustration from my own life. And many of you have heard this. But there was a time in my life where God told me to go share the gospel with one of my uh, friends who was um, a shipmate of mine on board ship when I was in the Navy. And I went to, I was on my way to talk to him about the Lord when a friend of mine came and said, hey, let's go over to the Family Fun Center. Let's go mini golfing. Now, how many of you know mini golf is not a sin? You know, if you want to go mini golfing, great. Not a sin. But at that moment, when it took the place over the direct word of the Lord that said, go share the gospel with him, guess what became sin? Mini golf. And see, mini golf was good, but it wasn't what God had for me in that moment. Now, I'll shorten this story up a lot. What happened that night is the young man God sent me to, to share the gospel with, ended up going to a party. He got drunk and on his way back to the ship, wrapped his motorcycle around the telephone pole and killed himself. I believe that had I been obedient, he would not have died that night. 
And it was one of the hardest things for me to deal with because I believe that the blood of that young man was on my head, my hands, because I disobeyed God in that moment. I literally walked around for two, year, two days weeping. I, I couldn't stop crying because I was so guilt-ridden, if you will. It took a lot for me to pray through that because I just felt I had so failed God. And I was so disappointed in myself. But one thing it taught me to do is if God tells you to do something, move quickly. If he says you need to do this, do it quickly. Don't wait. Don't put it off. Don't hesitate. Immediately go get it done. Because you don't know that it might be somebody's life that you save in that moment. It might be as simple as God impressing you to call somebody during this time. Pick up the phone and call. You'd be surprised how many people are on the verge of suicide and your phone call might be the very thing that saves their life because instead of pulling the trigger, they picked up the phone. And I, I know that sounds a little drastic, but I'm telling you it's happening. It's happening right now where people's lives are being saved because people are being responsive to the Holy Spirit. They're listening to what the Holy Spirit is saying. And as a result, they're being obedient and they're picking up the phone. They're calling, they're encouraging. Or just maybe like Carrie mentioned earlier, in a moment, do you need toilet paper? You know, what do you need? Yeah, as a matter of fact, boom. But you don't know what that ripple effect will have. What does that do in that person's life where they start thinking about somebody else and how they might be a blessing? And that person might touch the one that was suicidal. You know, just recently, I've been put in touch with an individual that grew up right across the street from my kids here. And, and most of you have been to my home. And they, they grew up right across the street. Their husband um, uh, just recently committed suicide, just within the last four weeks. And did so right in front of them. Now that is a very difficult situation for her and her children. But how does it get to the point where somebody is so hopeless that they're willing to kill themselves in a manner like that? It breaks my heart. I mean, it just breaks my heart that that would take place. Where is the church, and hear me very carefully, where is the church to rise up and pick up a phone and say, listen, tomorrow will be better. Today might look bleak. You might be out of work today. You, you might uh, be going through a difficult financial struggle today, but tomorrow will be better. This too shall pass. Let's believe God. Let's trust God together. And um, man, you know, it, it's things like that that just touch you because you start thinking this is a window of opportunity. Turn from our wicked ways. Let's not get caught up in blatant sin, and let's definitely not substitute good for God's best. But then the promise comes. Then will I hear from heaven. I love that. God says, I will hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. If the United States ever needed healing, if we ever needed a wound bandaged, it's right now. Too many people are looking for, I mean, I even look at the, the uh, governmental bailouts right now that are going on and thank God for the people that they've helped. But how many people today are looking for the next one? They're looking for the next stimulus. They're looking for this uh, plan of paying everybody $2,000 a month for the next six to 12 months to make sure everybody's taken care of. This is not the answer because government, whatever you turn to in crisis is your God. If you think of it like that, it'll make you think twice. Whatever you turn to in your moment of crisis will be your God. If you've got a headache and the thing that you turn to first is Advil, guess what? That has now become your God in that situation because God was not first place. Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all those things are added unto you. Now, I'll tell you, I don't know how many of you have ever read that passage out of the Message Bible, 
but it will do something for you. It will just absolutely shake you up a bit when you read it out of the Message Bible. It's so encouraging. Matthew 6.33 says, Steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Now listen to verse 64. Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. Don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. I love that. You know, as, as many of you know, we would say wherever you're at, be there. Just be there. What is God doing right now? Don't worry about tomorrow, what tomorrow might bring, or a month from now, six months from now. And again, rightly dividing my words, you know I believe in excellence. I believe in planning. I believe in sitting down and having things, but not to the exclusion of God. If God can't fit into your plans, then your plans become God. And when your plans fail, your God has failed. And then that's when you can fall into depression. That's when you can get into all these other situations where you're willing to take your own life because nothing about that worked out. And, and uh, I shared probably four or five weeks ago, some pastors I was talking to and they said, uh, you know, we've got a one year, two year, five year and 10 year plan. Well, that's great. I'm all about the plans. But what about God? Where does he fit in your plan? Because remember, many are the plans in a man's heart, but it's God's ways that prevail. So I want to know, what is God saying in the moment? What is he saying to us? Well, he says, I will hear from heaven. I will hear from heaven. I'll listen from heaven. I'll forgive their sins and I'll restore their land to help. That's what I want to see. I want to see our nation back to health. I don't want to see the great divide. We've watched this divide happen for the last 12, 16 years. It's really been progressing downhill. And there's such a divide amongst people. Now, I understand that in the last days, there would be a great divide between the sheep and the goats. Listen, I'm not willing to write anybody off as a goat because God isn't. They're still his people. And he wants them as part of the body of Christ. We're never going to see eye to eye on everything, but we can always agree with the word of the Lord. If the word of the Lord is so and true, it's set, the psalmist said it's settled forever in the heavens, then I believe that. Let's get united in spirit, uh, as Ephesians 4 says, maintaining the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, because unity of faith might be a ways off. But unity of the spirit can be there. Instead of listening to somebody and finding how you disagree with them, listen to them to find the point of agreement and then highlight that. I was talking with an individual today that politically we are probably at opposite ends of the spectrum. But there are some things we agree on. So guess what I will discuss with that individual? Mm -hmm. I'm going to discuss the things that we agree on, not the things that we disagree on. Amen? I think those things are very powerful things. Okay, I'm going to open this up just for a few comments. Uh, if you have any, feel free to share your what thoughts. I gave you? What do you mean? Remember I gave you... I'll silence that one for a moment. Pastor, Pastor Lonnie, I... Uh, would like to just read uh, Psalm 27 verse 14. Please. Wait on the Lord for his good things and I shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say on the Lord. Amen. The reason Amen. why I bring that up is because there's so many uh, people in, in restaurants and, and uh, servants who are out of work. Yes. And yet, God would say the same thing to them that he says to, to us. How do you wait on the Lord? What should be the desire of our heart but to wait on him as if he was our favorite customer? Very good. Very good. 
And we know the word says, when you wait upon the Lord, as Isaiah says, your strength is renewed like the eagles. Amen. You know, it's that waiting upon the Lord. And that's the exact interpretation, to wait, to be a servant. Not to wait as in do something, God, but to wait as in being that humble servant. That's exactly correct. Beautiful. Beautiful. Anybody else? Mine is just really, really simple. Um, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. But in one of the translations, it says, I have everything I need. And I can wake up and be kind of, hmm, whatever. But I can say, but, but Holy Spirit, I need you to show me joy, to... The, the need isn't the physical, it's the spiritual. Show me and be that to me. Be what I need more than all of the, the stuff. Be what I need. Amen. Any other thoughts? In. Um, I host a connect group and we have agreed to uh, meet every week rather than every other week and um, quite a few of the people that come are very new to faith yeah. and I'm finding the most powerful thing where our time together is vulnerability that when one is vulnerable the rest of them have permission to really talk about where they're at um, and so I'm, God is coaxing me into a place to say, yes, you are to lead them well. Um, and he's teaching me the balance of, of when and how to be vulnerability and vulnerable and lead. Right. And, and <clears throat> there's a key when you're, when you're helping to lead. You have to understand that when you confess your faults, you do so to a righteous man. New believers in the Lord obviously may not be there. That's right. not the appropriate place to be vulnerable. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because yeah, I think that's what I that that's the balance I'm getting to. I would probably share a story that God brought me through and talk about what He did and what I learned. Not necessarily talk about something super current, sure. but talk about what God did and what He taught me and what the power of righteousness in that thing. But yeah, absolutely. Amen. Amen. It's really, uh, important for us to understand how that operates. So, um, I'm getting a lot of feedback on my end. I just it wasn't it wasn't you. It was another mic. I just I just silenced them. Oh. Um, so yeah, absolutely. To understand how to lead in a way and make sure that you're always in a place where you've got a peer level relationship that makes sense you've got always people that you can look up to that you can go to yeah. you've always got people that you are uh mentoring you yeah. need those three levels in your life at all times yeah. uh regardless of who you are when you've got those three levels you'll find a more balanced life because you can run to somebody when you need to and you can love them uh, certain people, your peers, you go through it at the same time. Those that you are mentoring, you strengthen and encourage them with the word. So, yeah. Good. Can you define those three again? Because I I must have missed one. Yeah, you've always got those people that you can go to with your issues. Mm -hmm. You always take your problems up, in other words, and your praise down. So okay. if you've got a problem, you've got somebody you can go to and say, man, I'm struggling with this. Can you pray with me? That way you're not casting your pearls before swine. Not yeah. that people intend to be that way, but yeah. they'll turn and rend you with it. The next thing you know, it's out there as general gossip because yeah. oh, that's what they're going through. Um, yeah. You know, I've got pastors that struggle with stuff all the time and they'll call me up and say, hey, pray with me about this. Great. We're going to pray. We're going to see that thing resolved. They'll yeah. never, they never have to worry about that being put out publicly. It's just that's not going to happen. But then you've got peers. And those peers are the people that you're, you're in the trenches together. You're uh, 
combat soldiers together, if you will. And you're going through that. One gets their helmet blown off. The other one gets, you know, uh, wounded in another way. But you're always there strengthening each other and saying, hey, it's okay. We're going to make it out of this foxhole. We're going to do it together. We're going to win. But then you've also got those you're always mentoring. Yeah. And those that you're always encouraging, you're always building, you're always praising them. Um, you would think of it as a parent, child, and a grandparent type thing. Oftentimes you may need to go to that grandparent and say, here's what I'm dealing with, or that father or mother, or something like that. Yeah. And then your friends that you deal with, and then your children. You know, we would never want our children to see the struggles we go through because they don't understand them. Somebody that's new in the Lord may not understand that struggle. But like you said, after you've gone through it, you've come through and you've had a great experience, you can share that. That gives them hope and encouragement on how to make it through. Yeah. Amen. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Joel and Don, how are y'all doing? Once I get us unmuted, we're doing great, I think. <laughs> awesome. It's good to see you. Oh, thanks. I know. This is one of my favorite times of the week because I get to see folks that we normally hang out and just love on each other and the things of God. So, And for all of our new guests tonight, it's so nice to have you with us. Feel free to drop in yeah. anything you want. We uh, yeah, this, that's just awesome. a real down-to-earth home group and... Um, you know, not not uh, everybody even knows we're doing these, but it's just a real comfortable time. Like I said, I hadn't even, um, I've never mentioned them before, but I did a little live Facebook thing about an hour before the broadcast. I was just sitting out on my deck and thinking about all of God's goodness and what it was that he's doing in my life. And, and I said, you know what, I'm just going to share with everybody what I'm thinking about right now and how I'm feeling right now what an opportunity we have before us. And so we had a few others join us and I'm so glad you did. You're always welcome. Um, anybody else? Amen. Amen. Well, um, this will be up on our Bible study link. So if anybody would like to have a replay, they're able to do so. Um, if you're not subscribed on YouTube, go over to YouTube and subscribe. Uh, the best way to do it is um, youtube.com slash user slash destiny Spokane. And that'll put you right there. Okay, so that's uh, that'll put you right in. I didn't realize how long I've had this YouTube channel. <laughs> If you want to think about being around a long time, this I actually started this YouTube channel in 2004. <laughs> so uh, we've been around a bit. <laughs> oh, that's almost embarrassing. I didn't even know YouTube had been around that long. But uh, yeah, how old were you then, Tia? <laughs> what was the year again, 2004? Yeah. Oh, I was 20. 20 years old. Tia yeah. grew up, she kind of grew up in my church, and uh, I had the opportunity to pastor her for a lot of years, so it's good to uh, see what she's doing now and how God's using her, and it's just going to get better. Come on, amen. I'm All excited. Right. Well, Daniel, so nice having you with us today. Thanks for dropping in and being a part, and Simron. I don't know if she's still with us or not, but uh, it was nice having her from India for a while. And uh, yeah, just all of our regulars. Oh, by the way, um, uh, for, um, oh man, all of a sudden I just went blank. Um, Shelly and Brian? Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Shelly and Brian, uh, her mom passed away this week. And so we've been in prayer with uh, them and just seeing if they needed anything. So missing them tonight, that'll let you know. Um, that's been a, a real relief for them. Mom had, had struggled for quite a while. 
And so, as you know, last week we talked about just letting, saying we let you go. And uh, when they did that, mom went home. So uh, it's oh. nice that she's with the Lord. Corey, any words you have for us? Uh, not really. Not really? Okay, it's good to see you, Corey. Thanks. Um, we're going to go ahead and wrap up in prayer then. And I'm going to have Don close us in prayer tonight. I thank you and I praise you, Father, for tonight's word. I thank you so much, Father, that um, the revival is coming to this land, Father, that we have been praying for it and requesting it. And, Father, you are healing this land, healing it not only of this horrid disease, but of all the um, hate and unlove and division that uh, has been going on. We thank you and we praise you for it. Father, and we thank you for your anointing upon everyone here so that we can go out and touch other people, Father, whether physically or not. Um, we can touch others with you, yeah. Father, that they know it is definitely you that is speaking through us. We thank you and we praise you, and we thank you for your protection and your provision over each and every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Again, thank you, everybody. I forgot to mention if you want to be a part of the. Um, Insights, uh, discussions, those are Saturdays at 10 a.m. Pacific, and it's dvim.online.church, dvim.online.church. And so on Saturdays, if you're not busy during 10 a.m., join us, and uh, we'll have a great, great, great time together. Uh, it'll be awesome. All right. Pastor Lonnie, can you announce yeah. that on YouTube? What's that? Do you announce that on Facebook or anything? Uh, I, I have in the past. Uh, do a, I'll do about a half hour and 15 minute live just to let people know it's coming up. But our past ones are also on YouTube. So if you subscribe to my channel there, you'll be able to see the, the previous ones uh, with Pastor Tony. We just started two weeks ago. So it's brand new. Um, cool. And just getting people. Like I said, we just started this. Um, I just really, I've had this YouTube channel, like I said, since 2004 and never did anything with it. How embarrassing is that? You know, you talk about God having to kick you upside the head and say, come on, Dim, why don't you go get something done? And, <laughs> uh, so finally, four or five weeks ago, decided I should do something with this wonderful channel that I have. Why don't we go do something with it? And so we started, we only, I think I had three subscribers you know, four or five weeks ago, because <laughs> just, I'd never done anything with it, so since then, we've got, I think we're at 60 some people subscribing now, I expect it to start taking off, and uh, yes. getting people around the globe doing things, so anyway, you're all welcome to join us for that insight uh, discussion, it's been a lot of fun, Pastor Tony was great this last weekend, some real insight, and one of the things that he said um, there's a difference between lack and absence. Mm. And man, it really, you know, struck a chord because so many times we forget that lack and absence are two different things. And yet we equate them and they really aren't equated. So during this time, we have to see the difference between absence and lack. Um, we're not children of lack. God has not called us to be children of lack. He, we're, he's Jehovah Jireh, the provider. But we may have some absence, but it's temporary. And uh, it's really, when we come to some understandings like that, it's great. He had some great, great thoughts that were there. And uh, Pastor Stephen Strader from a couple weeks ago <coughs> had some great things to share. And then this week, you're going to love this week with Jeff Pruitt. He pastors a church, about three, 4,000 people there in Milwaukee. Um, and it, we had a great interview. It's, as you know, these are pre-recorded, but we respond live during that time. So we had a great time with Pastor Jeff. You're going to love, love, love him. He's a great guy and um, really looking forward to what he has to, has to share. So any questions, any comment? Again, that's DVIM for Destiny Vision International Ministries dvim.online.com 
and you'll be able to catch up with us all there. Okay, blessings all. Callie, is that how you say your name? Good seeing you. Glad you were with us tonight. Okay, guys, have a great week. Bye. Have a great week, everyone. Bye, Joe and Callie. Good to see you here, Bye. too. Bye, everybody.